Welcome to Bristol Festival of Ideas Online. The recording of this event missed off a few minutes at the very beginning. The chair is Zoe Stedman-Milne from Festival of Ideas. We join as she introduces the event, which is part of the Novel Writer Series that invites debut novelists to read and talk about their work. The Novel Writer Series is a Festival of Ideas and Spike Island partnership and usually takes place in Spike Island Cafe in Bristol. Um, but for obvious reasons, Festival of Ideas and Spike Island have moved their events programme online this autumn. So please check both our websites for up-to-date listings and support our events through these unusual times. Spike Island Galleries have reopened with Denzel Forrest's exhibition, Itching and Scratching. So if you are in Bristol, uh, you can go to their website for the opening hours and the visitor information. But back to tonight. I'm delighted to welcome Diane Cook as our novel writer this evening. Uh, well, it's evening here. It's daytime where Diane is. Uh, Diane is a novelist and short story writer. Her collection Man vs. Nature was shortlisted for the Guardian First Book Award and the LA Times Book Prize. Her stories have appeared in Harper's, Tin House and Granta and been anthologized in Best American Short Stories. The New Wilderness is her debut novel and is shortlisted for this year's Booker Prize. The winner will be announced in, there it is, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, the winner will be announced in just under a month's time on the 19th of November. Uh, so if you haven't read it already, there's still time and I can highly recommend it. And hopefully after our conversation, you'll be desperate to go out and buy it. And in fact, there's a little link below that you can click. Uh, don't click it now, wait until later, but you can click it and buy from our partners at Waterstones. So Diane, thank you so much for joining us and welcome. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. <laughs> so for where's can work? <laughs> Diane and I will have a little conversation. Um, there's going to be a few readings and there'll obviously be some time for some questions as well. So there's a little ask a question section again below us. So do pop your questions in there. I'll keep an eye on it and we can get take them to Diane later. So I thought, well, let's just get the prize out of the way, actually. Let's just quickly have a quick prize conversation. So you've been nominated and you've won prizes for other writing, um, but how does it feel to have your first novel recognized this way? Uh, incredible. I mean, I was very surprised. Um, to me, the Booker is always just, it's this huge international award where everybody, you know, I mean, it's like the where Hillary Mantel wins, basically. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's just like the big writers. Um, and I know lots of different kinds of writers get nominated for that's part of what's so interesting about the booker for me is that the books are very, you know, they vary every year, I think, in really interesting ways. Um, but yeah, I never thought that I would get nominated. Um, and I'm really happy uh, that that happened because especially with the pandemic this year, publishing a book was pretty challenging. And a lot of, especially debut authors, didn't get a, much recognition. Um, people were distracted, obviously, um, by the pandemic. And it was a big year for books. So um, the fact that like a, a more than a couple books, debut books were nominated was really, really special. Um, and a lot more people have read my book now, and that is exciting to me. It's scary too, a little bit, but it's mostly exciting. <laughs> so with that, would you like to do a little introduction and sort of tell us a little bit about the novel and maybe as a way of giving people a flavor, we could have a, a little reading to start us off? Yeah, that's great. I'll tell a little bit about it. Um, the New Wilderness is a speculative novel. It imagines a future world, a future country where, um, there's no wilderness area left, like no state forest, no national forests, no preserves, just this one wilderness area um, called the wilderness state. And all other land in the country is used for things like farming or um, where pe it's where people live or it's where things are built or it's where, you know, we get harvest wood or, or mine or, or anything. All of the land is being used to support the population that exists. Um, and so it's a it's a world where there's just no contact with, um, and the place where people live, the city is pretty polluted. Um, it makes people sick, and the novel follows this mother and daughter who have lived in the city, and the daughter's very sick um, from living in the city, and she's going to die if she doesn't find a new place to be, like. The doctor calls it new air. Um, she needs new air if she's going to survive. And so 
be the mother and Agnes, the daughter, sign up for this new experiment um, that will put 20 people in the wilderness state as a new version of nomadic hunter gatherers to kind of see what happens when people interact with nature because that kind of interaction has complete, completely been lost to history. Um, and so they go to the wilderness state and they live there and the novel more than more than a novel about like how people survive, you know, the day to day and like fight and and um, and it's not like this like huge dramatic thing where every day they're fighting, you know, they're like fleeing from fires and floods and whatever. Um, but it's really about like how people survive after how people live after learning how to survive, if that makes sense. Yeah. And the book is really about the mother and daughter and how their relationship changes now that the daughter is well, because when she gets there, she flourishes. Um, but because she flourishes, there's a pressure put on the mother and daughter um, and their relationship as she grows up in that place. So um, it's a it's a human story set in a really drastic um, and intense uh, landscape. Um, and it's a nature book as much as it's a book about relationships. Um, so I'm gonna read a little bit about, um, a little bit from about 10 pages in. This is a scene where we meet the community um, who lives with B and Agnes. There's about 20 people there when the, you know, there were 20 people when the experiment started. There aren't 20 people anymore, but, but <laughs> you get into that in the book. Um, so this is a part where we meet the community and we see them trying to um, move from one place to the other um, in their normal daily walkings or weekly walkings. River Nine moved fast and swelled against its banks. And to the community, it looked like a wholly different river from the one they were familiar with. So different that they had consulted the map again, trying to match the symbols with what they with, with what was now there and what their memory insisted ought to be there. They'd crossed the river many times since they first arrived in the wilderness state. From their encounters with it elsewhere, they had even considered it a lazy river, the way it turned tightly back and forth through rocks and dirt from the foothills down across the sagebrush plain. They had a usual crossing spot that they'd considered safe, or as safe as a river crossing could be. But it looked as though a storm had altered the bank and submerged the patch of island where they used to regroup before attempting the far bank. It was a very helpful little island, but it was gone now, and they could no longer be sure where that fording spot was. Perhaps the same storm that had kept them on the other side of the mountains since last summer had also remade this river. They lowered themselves and then the children down a small ledge to the almost non-existent bank where the greens grew, a color found almost exclusively next to rivers. The grasses, mosses, the striving trees, so thin they could be snapped between two fingers, their new spring leaves, quivers of creamy green. They handed down their bedding rolls, the pouches of smoked meat, jerky, pemmican, the harvested pine nuts, precious acorns, wild rice, einkorn, a handful of wild onions, the disassembled smoking tent, their personal satchels, the hunting bows and arrows, the bag of hollowed wooden meal bowls and the chips of wood and stone they used as utensils, the precious box of precious knives, the book bag, the cast iron, the manual, and the bags of their garbage they carried with them to be weighed and disposed of by the rangers at post. In the water, a loose log stripped naked of its bark and limbs bobbed and rolled past, even though the nearby landscape was treeless. The log must have traveled from the foothills, the unusual torrent of water ushering it through. On a lazier river, or even a lazier part of this river, a log might have gathered farther upstream in an eddy or been nudged onto a bank. But here it rolled in the rapids, rapids they'd never even noticed in previous crossings, when their water was low and any white water was just a skimming thin hat that the river rocks wore. They watched another log vault head over tail, after which Caroline, 
took her first tentative step out into the water. Caroline was their river crossing scout. She was the most sure-footed, had the lowest center of gravity. Her toes could grip like fingers, beautiful toes wasted for years crammed into shoes in the city. She'd learned that most, she'd learned the most about how water behaved. She was good at making sense of things that seemed erratic. Okay, Caroline yelled over the rumble, her feet firm in the first foot of water, testing its pull, deciding whether to continue. Rope. Carl and Juan handed her one end of the rope, which she secured around herself, and they looped once around each of their waists. Carl behind Juan, and then held the rope in front of them. The children and the other adults stood as far back as they could. They had already tried to ford two other spots, but Carolyn either feet out from the bank or waist deep in water returned to the shore each time. It's too deep, or it's too fast, or see that lip? That's a pock somewhere under the water that will take us down. On this, the third spot, Carolyn waded out halfway. From the bank, things looked promising. She paused, her head cocked slightly, like a coyote listening for the calls of the wilderness. Friend or foe, friend or foe. Her hands hovered over the white water and it broke around her body and came together again behind her. Caroline turned her head toward them, her shoulders following, a hand turned palm up, about to signal something. She opened her mouth to speak, just as the tip of a log surfaced where she stood, and with a terrible thwack and splash, Caroline was gone. I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it leads me quite nicely into sort of one of my first questions, which is, um, how obviously nature is a massive part of this book, but how did you go about creating the sort of the world for the wilderness? Did you have to set yourself? I always imagine when novelists are having to create worlds, they have to set themselves parameters or rules. Um, you know, how much do you take from real places? Do you, you know, do you do that thing where you've created your own little map? Um, yeah, I'd be just interested to know. And how, again, as you're reading that, you do sort of get elements of the idea of sort of pioneers in the sort of the new world so how much of things you have seen and read in your own time did you have to sort of put to one side or ignore or sort of borrow from i borrowed or you know i was inspired by lots of different relationship or historical relationships with the landscape of us you know of the united states but especially the american west um so i was uh originally thinking about like a primitive group of people who were there which i believe are called the clovis people um and i was just trying to i was inspired by their um interaction with the land and then obviously with native american uh groups um and how they use the land but also you know this idea of the pioneers coming across the country and those very early people who fled whatever they saw as impinging on their life in the east and moved west into this unknown place that there was where there was no certainty and um and I was thinking about their relationship to the land as they moved into this new place. It must have been so alien to them. I mean, imagine the landscape of the West is so extreme. Um, and I really was trying to kind of get into all perspectives of different relationships with that land. Um, as far as inspirations, I spent a lot of time in Eastern Oregon, which um, is actually a high desert. It's this empty, empty place full of sage and juniper trees and these weird, um, the landscape is like, it's not flat, but it, you can kind of see how the earth is shaped. Like there are these like huge, like plates of land that kind of sweep up and then drop. And um, there are these you know, dead lakes everywhere because it's, it's a desert. Um, and it's just so stunning. And I hadn't intended to 
place my book there, but once I saw the landscape, I felt like I needed to. There was something that it was um, communicating to me that made sense for like the plight of the people in, in my book. Um, and it was also this area where there's this really early um, cave, this um, primitive cave where they've found, uh, I guess, fossilized human excrement um, from, mm. you know, I don't even, I'm not even going to pretend to know the date or the year, <laughs> just to say that it's like from early Clovis um, primitive, uh, you know, like uh, nomadic people. Um, and so it's this land, and there's petroglyphs everywhere. And so I just like it, the land had all this history for me to play around with. And so in building the world, in building this future world, I, I looked backwards a lot, which was an interesting kind of exercise. Um, yeah. Well, and interestingly, one of the things I didn't realize until I was sort of thinking about this conversation was how very cleverly you don't sort of you don't do that thing where you've set everything for up from us and actually how little detail I needed in terms of knowing about certain aspects of your story. So and I wondered, it's that idea of, you know, we didn't need to know how the city had got so bad. You know, it was kind of we just you know, as a reader, we kind of know how the city got that bad. Um, and I wondered whether you, I suppose when you were sort of deciding certain things about what you do and you don't tell us what you decided the reader would be able to imagine for themselves and sort of uh, create for themselves, um, what you what you wanted to sort of say to us about sort of um, climate change to a certain extent or how we should be feeling about nature and the city. Yeah, I mean, the the balancing act you do as a writer, especially who's working in like imagining future dystopian worlds or just even future worlds is is how much is necessary. I mean, you're telling a story and you kind of have to decide what the story is. Is the story about how we got to this point or is the story about everything that came after? And I decided for me, the story was everything that came after. And so I wanted to keep everything minimal um so i don't explain and how we got to this place but i hope there are enough kind of clues in it in the book that a reader or you know most readers can come away realizing that we got into this situation by just continuing to do what we were doing um i didn't want there to be this like huge calamity i didn't want there to be like a coup or you know a virus or you know some kind of war that led us to this place where the world is bad and the city is bad the city's been bad for people at various junctions of history um based on you know industry or overcrowding or poverty um and i wanted the city to be vague enough that people reading it could put their own kind of worries and fears into that storyline and they could say well i don't i don't exactly know how this these people arrived to this point in this book but i can imagine it um and it might look a lot like where we're headed um because of various reasons um it's always a it's and i said it's a balancing act because some writer some readers don't like that <laughs> some readers like to be told everything and, and I'm not one of those readers so I think then I become the kind of writer who pulls back a little bit and really tries to figure out what is the what is the least amount of information that I can give so that the book isn't about that information but it is about the reality of the world after those things have happened well and because I wondered whether this comes from being a short story writer, because a short story writer, to a certain extent, doesn't have the benefit of pages and pages to set up storylines and explain everything. And I wondered how much of that was a sort of part of the way you created this novel. Did you, is that something, I don't know, is that something conscious or? I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Um, I've thought about this because, you know, I think we were talking right before the break uh, or right before this started um, about, you know, this being my debut novel, but it's, you know, whether or not it's actually the first novel I've written. And it is <laughs> secretly, you know, this is the first novel I've written. So it's possible that 
I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, I, it's definitely, it's a definite fact that I didn't know what I was doing all the time because it's a new form and, you know, um, and I was experimenting and trying things and seeing what could work. Um, I definitely think subconsciously there's something about story writing, short story writing that affects maybe your tendencies in a novel. Um, I think there's a little hesitation in my part to over explain things because you just never do in a story. Um, and I think maybe subconsciously I was trying to see how, where these two forms meet, like in that Venn diagram, like what do they share and what doesn't work in one that works in the other and vice versa. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of it was not purposeful. It just was maybe how I think about what I like in story and in, in any story, whether it's a long or short, a novel or a short story, what I like those stories to do, how comfortable I am with um, following a writer into a new world, um, how much information I need and, and uh, more about, yeah, the, the unconscious level of comfort I have um, as a reader myself. So definitely, yeah, I think there's probably a lot that goes into writing stories because I, they are, are just so, but um, this novel isn't short but in any way. So I don't know what happened there. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's move on more sort of into some of the themes of the novel. And for me, the, the major theme um, is the sort of relationship between B and her daughter Agnes, but also B's own relationship with her own mother. Um, so for me, it's very much about the sort of the relationships of mothers and children and sort of the sacrifices, sort of limitations, um, the sort of aspect of that kind of all consuming love. But also there's sort of some quite sort of interesting moments. And again, the way you structure the novel. So you give the first half to B and then you sort of then you sort of give the second half, as it were, to her daughter Agnes. And so that's kind of quite a nice structural moment. Um, but there's some kind of quite sort of, well, moments that sort of resonated with me. Uh, sort of B says to Agnes at one point, of course you hate me, I'm your mother. Um, and there's Agnes sort of, uh, this is sort of later on in the novel, Agnes, um, she hated how easy it was for her to love her mother, how hard it was to remain indignant with her when her mother hurt her. She'd always love her mother, even when her mother didn't deserve it. It filled her with shame and with yearning too. And it's that kind of idea of uh, the sort of push and pull between mothers and daughters. And yeah, I was kind of interested in sort of, was that the sort of, was that always your focus? Yeah, I knew in starting out, um, you know, the, the novels began in my mind with a place, the, the wilderness state. I wanted to write about this, um, this, this last wilderness. Um, but very quickly, I knew that, in that last wilderness, we're going to be a mother and daughter, and the, the novel was going to be about their relationship and all the different peaks and valleys that that relationship can go through, um, and what it means, and what they're actually searching for when they're riding or traveling through those moments. Um, and, you know, I knew I always wanted it to from both of their perspectives but that was actually one of the most challenging parts of writing the novel was figuring out how to make that happen and letting as a writer tapping into both of those voices and feeling comfortable and um feeling comfortable getting into those voices and letting them take over parts of the book uh but yeah that's i write a lot about motherhood um and I really wanted to write this book trying to figure out how you can know things about people you've lost, whether that's in death or just in like a kind of fissure or break in the relationship that, that, that um, takes away your access, that your close intimate access to another person's emotions or intellect or, or, or heart. Um, I lost my mother like about 12 years ago. Um, and it was, I was young enough. I wasn't young exactly, but I was young enough that I, um, 
I hadn't asked her all the things that I should have asked her, you know, I, you know, I wasn't a mother yet. I wasn't married yet. Um, and as I did those things in life, um, I found that like I needed her and I needed to talk to her, but I couldn't. So writing this book in some ways was a way of like exploring, like how you gain the knowledge that like, is there any way to, to get that knowledge that someone takes with them when they pass along or become inaccessible to you, you know, whether it's death or some other way. Um, and so that's kind of how and why they have the journeys that they have together and the, and the relationships they have together. Agnes becomes a very different kind of person in the wilderness because the wilderness makes her evolve in a new way. And in that way, like she becomes lost to her mother and her mother becomes lost to her. And um, I really wanted to figure out how do people, how do, how do we bridge that fissure and still take from each other what we need um, to live? That, there's a moment, I think, sort of in the second half of the book where I think Agnes is thinking herself about motherhood and she asks B why she had her and sort of B responds that she she gets she sort of says I guess I wanted to be my mum to live her life the life I knew would work out with kids and everything working out okay it wasn't necessarily life I wanted just what I assumed would, would happen and that's kind of quite an interesting uh way I suppose that women look at each other uh, sort of through the generations and that yeah, that there's a pattern that you, you you follow in your mother's footsteps to a certain extent and that kind of sort of feeds through the novel I thought I thought quite sort of it's sort of hit, not really hidden but I it, for me it was there I could definitely sort of always sort of hear the echo of B's own mother in sort of all the decisions that she was making yeah and and also Agnes as the novel goes on has this maternal um drive and she really wants to have that kind of relationship too so I think someone described it as like a lineage of mothers um and that, that you feel that, I think that's exactly what you're saying. You feel that line there. And I wanted that very much. Like I wanted the reason, you know, I wanted B's own mother to be this. I mean, she's, you know, she's in the book. She's not in the wilderness state with them, but um, that's a, you know, that's like a, a touchstone for B and that like kind of a problematic part. Mm -hmm. um, she still feels like she needs her even though she has her own daughter and Agnes will move on in the novel to have a relationship that's mother like with another child and she will feel like she needs her mother. Um, so it's just, it's, I think that's so natural and I feel it so much as a mother now. And um, there's just, it's so also animal, you know, I mean, like we learn everything or animals in the wild and people like we learn everything from either our mothers or our parents like and usually in the animal world it's mothers and and then they and then the kids go off and then you know that's it and <laughs> and there's just something so basic about it but it's so complicated too and I just really wanted to explore that yeah it's 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 wonderfully complex and at times they're sort of quite sad but there's some really nice witty moments as well and um particularly the sort of idea of the watching i think that goes on the the way they watch each other which i and when i start to think about my own sort of relationships you sort of understand especially as a child how much watching you actually do and how much you sort of observe and that's very very interesting this sort of um feeds in slightly to it but another big aspect of the book is power and and the sort of the power that we want to exert over each other how we you know want to react in communities um and so you've you've sort of created this a sort of microcosm of this community um and there's the sort of push and pull again of who's in charge who's the, who is the leader who is really the leader and mm -hmm. i again you know you've you've got some very strong characters you've got sort of some background characters and i there's obviously there's a sort of a long history of the sort of the strong female characters in sort of dystopian futuristic novels and i wondered you know how much did you have to resist sort of staying away from some of those sort of character tropes in a way that sort of exist in kind of survival scenarios and how much how much you want had to use certain characters but how much you wanted to stay away from others 
Well, I definitely didn't want Agnes to be like Katniss, you know? <laughs> and at some point when they were like hunting with bows and arrows, I was just like, oh man. I mean, I hope, <laughs> I really am not trying to do this. I'm not trying yeah. to make a parallel. Um, and I think you can just only, uh, just let the character flourish the way they are. I tried to make her someone who wasn't, so much influenced by like the social world around her. And that I think that's partly what was so interesting for me about putting her back in the wilderness and having her be more influenced by animals than the people around her was that, you know, and especially in dystopian books from, I mean, from what I know, um, their, their worlds and their lives are so influenced by the social upheaval and the political upheaval and, there's always this outer story that's pressing down on them. I mean, I can't say always, but usually. And with this book, that, like we talked about earlier, that outer story is a little vague. You know, you can yeah. see through it a little bit. Um, and so I wanted, yeah, so um, I think it's just that I wanted Agnes to be the character she would, or the person she would be living almost outside of all of that influence and like who would she become if it was just a pure world that she lived in i mean i'm using pure um it's like kind of a biased term because i think that's one of the other things the book is looking at is like what is a pure place what is an untouched wilderness like what is this idea um what is a place that is pristine and what does that mean to be in it um, but she is, she's outside of all of that influence. And in that way, she becomes, you know, I hope someone that feels very different uh, than like the heroines of, of other books like that, even though I see her very much as a heroine, but she's fighting for something very different um, than other books seem to the heroines of those books are always like saving the world and she is saving her i mean it's questionable what she's saving if anything she's saving her home you know and maybe her sense of home and her sense of family and the people she cares about and not a greater world and the sort of one of the other aspects of it is the sort of how hardwired is self-preservation, I suppose, mm -hmm. because obviously the whole reason that this group is in the wilderness is to do with self-preservation. They wanted to escape the city um, to, you know, to, to get better. Um, you know, in Agnes's case, she was the city was killing her. Um, and again, the way they deal with each other within the community, you've always got to ask yourself how much of it is for the good of the community, as in the collective, we shall survive together, but at the same time, how much about it is about self-preservation. So I wondered if you come down on any side of that, do you think self-preservation is something that's, you know, is intrinsic to us or, or is it something that we are taught, something that society sort of tells us to be? I think it's intrinsic. Um... I think it is, and I and I don't mean that in a damning way. I think it's just so natural that you can't like argue yourself out of it. I mean, and I think maybe because the world is so big, like if we lived in small communities, I mean, we do live in small communities, but you know, there's, we know so much about so many people in the world. There's so many people who struggle and suffer and we know about them, but they're far from our lives or they, we just can't figure out our connection to them. And so we don't worry about it or we worry about it, but we don't think there's anything we can do. Maybe people volunteer, maybe they give money, maybe their entire careers and their life are actually spent trying to help people who need help. But m most people don't spend their entire lives trying to help people who need help. They spend their lives paying their bills, raising their family, taking care of their family, setting aside money for retirement. I mean, like we do the things that benefit us. Um, and I don't say that as a, um, and I guess I should say like in a capitalist society, that is the way it's run and <laughs> in America anyway. Um, and 
I don't say it as like a damning thing. I just think it, it's that it's true. And I guess I feel like if we accept that and acknowledge it, then, then maybe we can actually move past it and get to a different idea about how to live. Um, and I know that's like a vague statement, but I don't know how else to say it. Um, yeah, I know that well, went off the rails at the end there. <laughs> that's fine. I, I've actually just had a quick look in the in our, in our question section and actually an audience member is sort of saying, um, this is Sarah and she's asked, as a writer speaking about our choices at the level of society, how do you approach writing about these issues without being preachy, sneering, didactic? Sort of, sort of leads on, I suppose. It's yeah. How how can you do this? Which I think you do. But do you want to talk a little bit on that? Yeah, I mean, I hope I do that, and I, I think part of that comes from like where the book starts in mind. Like, I didn't start out r trying to write about climate change or power or a dis you know a dissolved society or or a bad world. Like, I actually didn't sit down to write a dystopian novel. Um, but I wanted to write about nature in the future and it's, and humans relationship with it. And without, you know, and I just saw that in the future, like there was just no way to talk about a future natural world without introducing climate change. And there was no way of talking about land use in the future without then stepping into the murky world of like government and and power and politics and and all of the ways that we end up on land or with land or without land that you know is beyond our control um but again like because i never wanted the book to be about those things i just as a as i was writing i just didn't make it about those things mm -hmm. but they came through um and so i wanted it to be kind of like told from the perspective of the people in the book who are just you know, normal people who aren't, they're not like the heroines who are trying to save the world. They're not fighting for the good of the world. They're just normal people living their life and surviving day to day. It just so happens that they are living a very extreme version of that survival, you know, that day to day survival. And that's where then the interesting stuff comes in and where I can start to compare worlds in a way that I hope isn't didactic and is more subtle and where you might step away from reading the book and think I'm troubled by the way they just accept death in the book, but maybe I shouldn't be, or maybe there's something to look at in that. Like, is that so different from something else we do? Like in the grand scheme of their world, is there a grand scheme of my world that I can look at and realize that maybe we're, I'm not that different from these characters. One of the things that the characters are doing in the book is realizing they're not that different from animals. And I think one of the things I really want a reader to be able to do is think I'm not that different from that character, even though that character is doing something I really can't imagine doing. I think that's what I found, sorry, most unsettling about everything. And whether again, whether that's because of the way you've allowed the reader to come to certain parts of the story on their own. But I found it very unsettling how easy it was to understand and agree with a lot of the choices that your characters make. Um, yeah, so, and that, which gives, I think, the novel a very sort of, yeah, eerie feeling throughout, which mm -hmm. I rather, in, I've got to say, I rather enjoyed. On, on this, should we have the um, the reading um, that you've chosen uh, from Agnes, that from Agnes's yeah. point of view? I think that's a nice aspect of, this gives us a bit more of a flavour about Agnes, but also about the wilderness, I think. Um, yes, so, yeah. great. So I'm going to read a part where one of the characters has just had a baby and they're walking. Um, they're kind of in this, you know, big migration with all these other animals moving from watering hole to watering hole because they're, there's, they're having trouble finding water in any other way. Um, so they, where I'm going to start, this character Val has just had a baby. Um, she's named, it's egret that might matter and agnes we're following agnes right now and she's kind of telling us about 
She's um, she's remembering how the animals reacted to the baby, and then she's thinking about her place in this new world, this animal world, and her place in the community. Agnes noticed that the animals at the watering hole were very interested in the new sounds from their camp. Females, mothers approached the camp, sniffing the air, excited and alert. They swiveled their ears. Baby egret sounded like their babies plaintive and needful and demanding. Agnes knew they wanted to help, to show Val how to soothe the infant, how to feed him, how to protect him. They assumed baby, Agri baby Egret was one of them, and Agnes had felt a small pang of jealousy over that. But walking ahead of the community, Agnes felt proud to be, the, to be leading, just another kind of creature on a mass migration, just creatures finding water the way all creatures must. It wasn't that she didn't always feel this way each day they'd been out here, that she was just another animal. Something about the scope of what she could see now, how massive it was. They often saw animals, a herd of deer, mating hawks, a wolf pack. The elk herd was the largest group of animals they ever came across all at once, other than flocks of birds. But flocks of birds didn't have that same battered hooves as the elk, that same sweaty fur. Looking across the vast plain and seeing all the animals moving as one in one direction with the same needs, she felt a part of the place in a way she hadn't before. And she'd never realized she'd felt apart from it, but she guessed she had in some unknowable way. It was their reliance on the water spigots, on the maps, on the fact that they checked in with rangers. They were never fully living on their own, not like these animals were every day, not until now. And she was leading. She thought about a conversation she'd have with Jake when he'd first arrived, when he'd asked how long she thought she would be staying. He had no concept that the wilderness state would be forever, having just arrived, bewildered but she'd never considered they would ever leave. When they'd left the city, her mother hadn't called it a trip or an adventure or something temporary. She had said, this is our new home. At the thought of leaving here, her breath caught in her throat. She felt like that small girl again, listless and coughing, turning a handkerchief red, unable to assert force on the world. But that was no longer her. She was no longer that small girl curiously watching from a distance, from behind her mother or behind Glenn, tentatively reaching out to touch a wet deer nose, breaking through a spider's new morning web, wiping dew and silk from her face with surprise. Now she was the head elk, the point of the V, the dominant doe. She was a part of it all. It all depended on her. Agnes sprinted ahead. She heard Val call for her to wait. Glenn croaked for her to slow down. Her own mother ordered her to stop. But she whooped in response and ran faster. She spooked the deer, which veered away. The geese above got smaller as they rose to retreat from such ecstasy. This was the last breath of that little girl. Agnes grinned. She did a cartwheel, whooped again. If she'd had something in her hands to dig deep into the dirt with, she would have buried her younger self. Instead, she made squishing sounds as she pretended to dig around in her guts. Then she dramatically pantomimed, pulling something out of her, the heart of that little girl. And with one last whoop, she threw it up into the geese and they honked and veered away, raining shit down around her. Then Agnes waited for the others to catch up. Thank you. Oh. Um, uh, it's, it's one of my, I think some of the, the, the passages where you are writing sort of in nature are some of my favorites in the book. I've got to say, you, you really get a sense of how much, yeah, you, you sort of enjoy, I suppose, writing about landscape and nature. It really comes across. Um, what, I've just noticed a question actually from an audience member and they've sort of said, this, suppose, uh, well, hopefully you can answer this with some hope, but do you think humanity can avoid getting to the point you've described in your novel? Um, you know, how hopeful are you that we can kind of 
Um, so I will say that I'm not, I'm not naturally a hopeful person. Um, and when I was writing this book, I didn't have a lot of hope. Um, I think the way to avoid things like this is to, you know, a great sea change of ideas and power. Um, I think you have to get rid of the people who brought us here. Um, like vote them out. <laughs> I don't, I don't mean anything more sinister than that. Just vote them out. Um, and you have to rearrange your priorities as a society, not just, um, a couple of people in charge. Um, even, even, I guess, politically, if we get out certain people, I just, there's just, everything's so interconnected. And this is where I start then getting hopeless. <laughs> just imagine like the whole span of what needs to happen in order for things to get better. I will say, however, that um, I got really hopeful this um, June, May and June, um, especially, I think early, early June, late May, when there were protests um, in the in the U.S. over um, police brutality and police violence against uh, people of color, and that protest and that unrest seemed to travel to communities all over the world in this way that felt new to me. Um, you know, it felt like it 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 went beyond the news cycle and it went beyond boundaries and it went beyond cultures and it became something that we, it seemed like people had finally found a way to say no enough. And I felt really hopeful at that because that kind of thing is a thing I never imagined in creating my future world. My future world is a world that comes out of that kind of protest and that ability to put, you know, a collective foot down. My world is built on the assumption that that never happens. And so my world can exist if that continues to happen and that there actually is change that comes from that kind of collective movement. Um, so I felt really hopeful from that. Um, and I hope, I hope that we all find a way to keep doing that kind of work on all levels, whether it's about social justice or environmental justice or, I don't know, capitalism, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, that's actually, we've, we're sort of coming towards the end of our time. So I'm glad we could sort of end on a hopeful note there. Um, before we finish, um, we have a little tradition with novel writers and that we'd like to ask our uh, guests to suggest some debut novels that we might not have heard of or that you are particularly excited about. Uh, they can be old or new. So is there anything you'd like to suggest to us? Yeah, um, so there's a novel coming your way uh UK um it's I think it's going to be published in like February or March um and it's a book called Temporary I have the US version with me um it's called Temporary Ooh. by Hillary Leichter it's brilliant it's this um surreal take on work um and a, like a the, the life of kind of people working now um, it's about a temporary, like a temporary, you know, uh, someone who oh, works as a temp. Okay. Like a temp. And, but it's, yeah. <laughs> um, but it imagines that that is not just like a job, an entire way of life, and that temps are, you know, something you're born into. Um, mm -hmm. And it's weird and brilliant. It's funny. It's so slickly mirroring our time now um, that it's kind of eerie and a lot of people it came out here in march um and it had that instant people instantly connected with it because it, it's so surreal and strange and right now feels so surreal and strange as far as like what work feels like in the pandemic and and just what it feels like to be kind of young and working in the world in this new era of what work can be people really kind of freaked out about it um and freaked out about how surreal our lives are right now um, in reading and could see that in the book. It's a brilliant, funny, wonderful book and it's going to come out. You're going to be able to buy it. It's by, I think, Faber's publishing okay. it and you'll love it. Oh, we'll definitely look out for that. You never know. We might be able to uh, include it in our series next year. Um, well, a reminder there that obviously 
you can buy Diane's amazing book. There's the little link below, but also all good bookshops will be stocking it. And uh, yes, there you go, look at that. <laughs> You've got the Booker Prize sticker. I haven't. I do. I got. I got the new. The you got new the special one. Yeah. Um, again, just a reminder: check with Festival of Ideas and Spike Island, who our autumn programs on our website. Sign up to the newsletters so you don't miss anything. Um, and yes, we will continue to put on events for as long as we can. So a small favor: um, at the end of this, you have the opportunity to donate towards us. We are offering all our events for free. Um, but if you like them and you want to help us continue, then every little is gratefully received and will help us continue and a return back next year. And hopefully be able to welcome Diane to Bristol one day in, in real life, which would be delightful, absolutely delightful. I love that. Yeah. So before you all rush off and buy Diane's book and yeah, donate money towards us, I'd like to say a big thank you to our audience for listening and a massive thank you to, to you, Diane. And we'll all be fingers crossed for the Booker Prize announcement next month. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It was lovely to be here. Oh, and you're welcome. You.